Hello, everybody, and welcome to Todd and Shane's Cloudy Podcast number 437, recorded live Wednesday, July 24th, 2019. So you guys might not remember us. I'm Todd. Um, he's Shane. I think he's over there. We do a podcast, <laughs> and it's been a long time since we've done this podcast. Yes, yeah, and, and I think the last episode we did, we started that one by saying it had been a long time since we'd done this podcast. And it's been even longer since I have actually produced a podcast. So I think uh, the last one I did was like April of 2017, something like that. Um, uh, so I'm, I've got a bunch in the uh, in the hopper here. I've just been busy uh, doing things, taking vacations, taking other vacations. Uh, you, you definitely get out and uh, you, you maximize those days off. So I, uh, you know, I got this new job, uh, getting all my vacation days in. Uh, you know, I gotta gotta do all that. Gotta, One of my coworkers, Derek uh, Derek Cash Peterson, he and his family are uh, living in Iceland this summer. So he lives in the Boston area, and he they they visited Iceland last year, I think, and liked it, and so they're just living there this summer. Yeah, that's. Um... I can't imagine doing that, but but I, also, well, no, awesome, you, but... you hate foreigners, so yeah, that's uh, that's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess over there I'd be the foreigner, so I'd hate myself. It would be very no, I know you. Uh, you hate foreigners when you're in their country. That's that's I've been with you in foreign countries before, and your contempt for them is uh, palpable. So to be fair, in Spain, I didn't have any problems there. I mean, I had problems with the food. I, I, you know, I don't remember that exactly, but yeah. But the other country, right, we'll just leave it nameless for yep, you know, this, yeah. feelings. Yes, those people hated me and I hated them. And it, it was... <laughs> you got off, to the, got off to a bad start yeah, in that particular country. Uh, but we've been to other countries uh, together and you've... Uh... I didn't have any problems when we went to Berlin. Yeah, that was that was the other one I was thinking of. I enjoyed that one. Yeah, I remember we went. Where did we go? We went somewhere to see something historical. I don't remember what it was. Uh, um, yeah, I don't remember if you went because I know uh, Jill and I went to East Berlin for some things, but I don't think you were with us on that. No, we went north, like where Churchill and those people planned something. I did not go with you to that. All right, I can never remember where I went, but I, I remember thinking that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool country. I'd go back. Germany was my first uh, European country. The second, I, I've been to Mexico once for spring break, but Euro, uh, Germany was my first uh, real trip. So it'll always be a special to me. And then now you've been to about a million places. I think I've been to 30 countries outside the U.S. I think that's where I'm at now. I don't know where I'm at. I need that. I'm probably less than 10. <laughs> yeah, I got, uh, got Denmark this year. Um Going to Antigua here in a couple of weeks. So get a couple of new ones. Yeah. I'd like to go to the Netherlands, right? All of a sudden I have in my circle of like people I work with or talk to or friends, I have a whole bunch of people from the Netherlands all of a sudden. I would love to go there just because I feel like I should. Netherlands was my second European country. Uh, very good. When you go over there, let me know. I'll go with you. I know you will. It's, it's great. I'll just like, you'll, you'll get off the plane and I'll be standing there and be like, Shane. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that's um, well. And so one of the things I have done, right, is I've let my passport expire, so I can't go anywhere. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You want to do that? It's not not a quick process. And also, if your uh, global entry has expired, or if you ever had that, that takes a long time too. Yeah, I had that. I've never used it, but I had that. And then, you know, what I'm still like, remember the whole TSA fiasco with you with the pre-check? Mm -hmm. I still cannot figure out what I can do about that. So what is your fiasco now? Well, I mean, I, mine all still works, right? But I got my pre-check the same way you did through Oh, Delta. gotcha. Yeah. But no one on the planet seems to know how to yep. extend, connect, log into that. Everyone just looks at me like I got two heads. I'm like... Yep. For those of you that aren't uh, privy to Shane and I's private conversations, <laughs> 10 years ago, I don't remember when it was, Delta had this program for its frequent flyers where it would sign you up automatically for TSA PreCheck. If you don't have TSA PreCheck, stop listening to this podcast right now and go get it. Even if you never fly, just go get it. It's that big of a deal. Um, and Delta would automate. It was so PreCheck was only good for a year, and then Delta would renew you automatically. 
I never did anything for it. Matter of fact, the first time I got it, I thought I was going to prison because it was. Um, <laughs> you thought it was the other type of check. Yeah, yeah. So I, so to tell everybody, so I was flying out of Vegas. So I'd been it was SharePoint conference or something, and I'm going through the regular, you know, strip you down, grope you. They get the, the gloves, all that line, and when they scan my uh, boarding pass, like a bunch of buzzers go off, and. Uh, they're like, oh, sir, you need to go to that line down there. I'm like, no, 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 it's good. I'm all good. No, I promise. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. They're like, no, no. So then, like, somebody from that line comes and gets me, and they take me down there. And I, I, I did. I thought I was in big trouble. I thought I was going in a little room, and and all of that. And no, it was because Delta had signed me up for pre-check. And so I'm by this time I'm down to like my underwear, and I'm trying to. And they're like, no, 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 sir. You know, keep your shoes on, keep your pants on. You're in pre-check now and put your laptop back in your bag, you silly goose. We don't do that down here. And I was so confused. Like, are they screwing with me? Um, so, that, I mean, that was how little I knew about all of that. Um, but then Delta just kept renewing it and I didn't ever think about it. And then Delta quit renewing it and didn't tell me. And so earlier this year, I was, you know, walking up to the airport like I own the damn place and going through the pre-check line. And they're like, well, sir, your boarding pass doesn't say pre-check on it. I'm like, oh, well, there must be some mistake. Allow me to get out the Delta app and show you how, hmm, it doesn't say pre-check here either. And they're like, all right, back to the other line there, fool. Uh, and so what had happened was Delta quit um, extending it. And they didn't tell me, so it expired. And the problem that Shane's having now is... All of the pre-check things that tell you, you know, like how to check your expiration and how to renew it, all assume that you signed up for it. They're like, well, use the username and password you used when you created it, except he didn't create it. He didn't know. Uh, so all of the things are there, uh, and we don't know how to get in there. So I had to start from scratch. This took me many months uh, to get that all done, and now I've got it the regular way, so I can log in now, but Shane's at some point going to have that horrible experience. Yeah, and I just don't understand. I mean, Delta literally did this for millions of people. Mm -hmm. You think someone of those millions of people would have solved this, or Delta would solve, right? I mean, th this is a common, common problem with their high-end customer base. Deal with it, Delta. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the chat room, so Lori and Stacy are talking about Clear, and I think you bumped into here. So Clear is a separate thing, totally unrelated to pre-check. You can have pre-check and clear. You can have clear and not pre-check, pre-check and not clear, whatever. Clear gets you to the front of whatever security line you're going to be in, pre-check or not pre-check. So clear is the thing where you uh, they check your skin, your eyes, or do your fingerprints or whatever, and they just skip you to the front of the line uh, where they verify your identification. So clear plus pre-check is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. and so Cincinnati put it in, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to... Uh... I don't remember if they have any kind of referral program. I'll see if they do. Like you might get some money off if I send you a thing. So. Or you might get some money back. Sweet. Um, but that was one of them. I thought that was dumb. And then Jason Himmelstein made me get it once and it's been great ever since. Yeah. So highly recommend that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I looked at it the first time it was out and then they, they got lost all their funding, right? So they got yanked out of all the airports and then now they're starting to show back up. And so when they showed back up in Cincinnati, I was like, this might might make a little more sense, but then I, I thankfully knock on wood, right? That's not wood. Where's wood? That's wood. Um, Your head. Um, I've not traveled much, so I'm back to not caring. But I had a, that window where I traveled a whole bunch again. I oh, I hate flying. Yeah. So Lori's saying it wasn't worth it for her because her home airport doesn't have it. Mine doesn't. I fly out of Des Moines. Des Moines doesn't have clear. But at least fifty percent of my trips are flying back. To, you know, to Des Moines. And so the outbound ones almost always have it. I'm always coming. And then if I uh, fly out of Minneapolis, if I drive up there, they have it. Um, so like at spring break, we, we flew out uh, to the MVP summit at spring break. And if there's a billion people everywhere, clear gets me right to the front of the TSA pre-check line. TSA pre-check gets me. Yeah, that's the problem. Right? The TSA pre-check line has gotten a lot longer in the last few years. It has, but it's still sh quicker because oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, it, um, it is still 10 times faster than the other one. But there, you and I were one of some of the first people to get it, right? It was literally no one. Yeah, you just walked through. Yeah. And they're like, oh, hey, Todd and Shane. Like, what's up? <laughs> yo, yo. You got anything? Nope. All right, just going through. It's good. <laughs> sorry, sorry to inconvenience you guys. Get out of here, you little scamps. Yeah, my boss is looking. Do you mind putting your thing on the belt, on the metal detector? Oh, you do? Oh, it's okay. I'll tell him it was all right. It's... It was a different story. Even my little Des Moines airport's gotten uh, busier. 
Um, so yeah, I get that renewed. Uh, and then, uh, the global entry, I got to get that. I got to go for the interview behind that. So um, do you have to re you have to re interview for that every time? I have to re interview because mine lapsed. I think if I would have renewed it, I wouldn't have to, but I'm starting from scratch and that's five years worth. And for me, the problem is there's no place you have to. So that's customs and border patrol which as you can imagine, Iowa doesn't have a lot of that. <laughs> so there's no place here that I can talk to those folks. So I'm gonna have to drive up to Minneapolis. So last time when I, when I originally did it, probably 10 years ago, I spent three hours driving to Minneapolis to the airport. I spent 17 minutes at the airport and then drove back three hours. Um, so I'm assuming I'm gonna have a trip like that. Yeah, that, and that interview process, I don't know about yours, but mine was, um not very hard no no that's the 17 minutes was here's how you use it uh get out of here yeah, yeah. they're like you know they're, they asked me some questions i guess about whatever i'd put on the form when i filled it out and i got them wrong and so they helped <laughs> and me get he them still right. gave it to you <laughs> they're like uh i'm like i don't know what countries i've been to i don't oh like god that. yeah i struggle with that anytime i got to put that anywhere how many countries you know which countries you've been to in the last three years <sighs> Who knows? And the and the real ones that sounds mean. The 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 major trips, right? The you know, so I remember Germany and Spain and the other one that we were not making fun of. Yep. You know, those I mean, those are fine. Yep. But it's all those Caribbean countries. Like, like yeah. which one's a country versus a territory versus a, yep. a quickie mart? I don't know. I and so Yep. Yeah, it's that's tough. So um Stacy is in Minneapolis, so maybe when I do my custom you know my my uh global entry thing i'll just you know i'll have stacy take me out for lunch or something and Aww, that'd be nice. just make a day of it uh you know get your know. hair did oh i do need that Whew, my hair's I know, your hair looks all right today i mean i'm fresh off my haircut but i got you know it's just and yeah. i haven't shaved since we did our last podcast which is why i have this incredibly manly beard you, you beat me to that i, I shaved yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> i was actually going to shave this morning i'm like no i'm gonna leave it on for shane i know how much he likes it i do yeah. <laughs> you, you should I just just go full beard. Just you know, if you start, I, now, I did, I did. What what do you what do you mean? The, what what? I mean, look. At, Sorry, let me rephrase. <laughs> Don't shave until after November is over, right? If you start now, you can participate in that November men's health thing. You just can't <laughs> shave between now and then. It's only July, so uh, yeah. Uh huh. Oh, too funny. Uh, so we, so it's been a month since we've done this. We've just got a million tech things to, that have happened since then. I just put a few in the notes. One of them I wanted to talk about, and we talked about it a little bit beforehand, was I've been spending a bunch of time working with Azure Functions. Okay. I've been sp uh, spending a lot of time the last couple of months just by happenstance. The majority of the customers that I've been working with have needed me to work some PowerShell magic for them. So I've just spent a bunch of time in PowerShell and uh, this Azure function bit is, is part of that. So for, for the folks who are listening that have not played with Azure functions yet, an Azure function is a process that lives in the cloud. It is serverless and all of that. And it runs code of some variety. Normally it's like an HTTP endpoint, but there's also timer job ones. There's a bunch of other things and they can run various languages. C sharp and TypeScript and all of that. I'm doing it in PowerShell because that's, you know, uh, all I have is a hammer. So everything looks like a nail. Yep. Um, and uh, it's been working pretty well. Getting them to work with PowerShell is a little tricky. Uh, and there's a bunch of different things about that. So I'll probably blog that. It will be a long blog post because there's just a lot of steps. I've already taken the screenshots and wrote it all down, but I need to break it up into consumable pieces because I'm doing a thing where I'm creating a, 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 an Azure function that uses PowerShell. And then I'm bringing in some PowerShell modules for that function to use. And then I'm using the commandlets in those uh, modules to authenticate against Azure AD and SharePoint Online and all that. So each of these pieces is a little complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, but it's becoming, it, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, because on-prem SharePoint, you know, it was PowerShell was right there. We were touching it. Boom, no problem. We never really thought about it. Yeah. Oh, I want to automate something. I just threw it in a PS1 or a batch file, Windows task schedule off and running. Yep. But now as we've moved to SharePoint Online, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing this as well, right? As customers are like, well, I want to automate in PowerShell and but I don't know how to get there. I mean, I can do it one time if I'm sitting in front of the keyboard, but how do I automate? And 
So uh, I think it'd be a very valuable blog post to see how Azure functions really come into play and make this a better story. Yeah, it's, man, so I've already written the process that's going to happen. So I talked a little bit about it before the show. I've got a customer that has properties in Azure AD and the group that I'm working, it's a big company. The, the group that I'm working with doesn't have any control over Azure AD. Of course not. Uh, and so the, and then we, we're setting up some practice. We're setting up things in SharePoint online and Mark and Derek are writing web parts that are exposed to different people. And there's all this functionality based on information about these users, but the information doesn't come out of Azure AD exactly the way that it needs to. And so those guys have done a great job making their end work, but the, the data in Azure AD needs to be massaged. So that's what I'm doing. My Azure functions and I've got two of them now. One of them is taking all of the users in Azure AD and dumping the appropriate fields out into a CSV file. And then the second function is taking that CSV file and transforming the data and then writing it to the user profile service so that their web parts and all that can work. And so it's different, you know, one of them's the Azure AD module, one of it's the PNP module, and I can do it. I've been doing it manually myself for a couple of months now, right? You know, I've got this function, this module, it's got these functions in them, but at some point I'm gonna roll off this project and they're like, how do we keep this going? And you're, you're right. So in the old days it was, well, you scheduled this PS1 file in a workstation somewhere, but man, that just seems so, you know, just, just caveman like. So I'm like, oh, Azure function. And uh, yeah, oh, well, so we're trying to help a customer with something similar. Um, they wanna move, like automate moving files from an on-prem FTP server or something silly like that off yeah. to uh, SharePoint Online. And so I'm like, oh, no problem. You know, map a drive and then, you know, good old uh, PNP PowerShell, whoop, 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 we're done. Yep. Works fine. Now they want to automate it. So I'm like, oh, well, you can run that as a scheduled task and a timer job. So they, I set them, I kind of said that and I moved on, right? Um, yep. And someone else on our team is kind of the, their main consultant. Well, so IT had to go build them a server to run this on. So the IT built them a server. So we go over there. Well, you can't map a drive. They troubleshoot, troubleshoot, troubleshoot. I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're troubleshooting the wrong thing. Yeah. You need the web client service to start to map a drive. Well, the web client service isn't here. Well, you need the desktop experience to get that. Yep. I mean, this simple little fix is, you know, it's been weeks in the making and, and I don't think they've got it solved yet because, you know, they can't get IT. Right? I'm like, basically, I can't help you until you can map a network drive to SharePoint Online from that server. Yeah. And that is just, you know, because nobody wants to turn on the desktop experience because it's scary and bad and I, I get it all, but. Can't you rewrite your PowerShell to not need a drive? Um, your PNP PowerShell? Because I copy files up to SharePoint Online all the time with PNP PowerShell and I never map a drive. Yeah, why do we have to map a drive? I, I don't remember. There's a reason we have to map a drive. I don't know what it is. But I, mean, I guess that would be another thing to look at. Maybe I need to go back and think about it from a different point of view. Since or maybe I'm... you're mapping a drive to the FTP site because there's no FTP client on there. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm not doing the work. I'm just kind of the one that comes in and says. <laughs> Every couple of weeks they come to you with a question you've forgotten. Yeah. Yes. Um, but no, it's, and I think that's a good reminder, right, though, is I always yell at other people for it, right, is you've got to maybe sometimes look at these problems from a different angle when the yeah. first one doesn't work and maybe that's it maybe i just need to go back and be like all right we'll just do this with add pnp file instead of maybe they're not using pnp they're using robocopy that's what it is oh yeah they should use pnp that's what it was because they already had an existing robocopy script so we were just trying to make their existing process there you go so it wasn't yeah. pnp it was robocopy yeah yep they could also use like the sharepoint migration tool the one from microsoft that's got powershell built into it and you can do file shares. Yep. No, um, yep. I will, uh, oh, there you go. See, look at us helping each other. Oh, that's just good stuff. Different angle. Like yeah. But the Azure function stuff's good. I've, I've enjoyed it. There've been some fun problems to solve. Uh, so I need to need to map out what it's going to be like two or three blog posts. I need to map out what those look like, but it's been very valuable. And the other thing is it's been, uh, the different pieces of it. So setting it all up has been complicated. And then I do it, and then a week later, I'm like, oh, I need to test it over here, and then I forget what I've done. So that was actually how the blog post was born was by, like, the third time me doing it, going, I'm just going to take screenshots of everything, and I'm going to help future Todd out. <laughs> I'm going to do this in a week again. There's a bunch of steps. 
darn future Todd. And you, you also said there was stuff that comes into play with like V1 Azure Functions versus V2. Yeah, so PowerShell has always been an experimental language. You remember college when we experimented in college. So PowerShell is a lot like that. And so the experimental languages are only supported in V1 functions, Azure functions. So when you create your Azure function, now the great thing is you can switch those back and forth. So when you create a function, V2 is better. So it creates it as V2. You can go in and swap it back to V1. If you, you, know, if you screw that up, you're not, uh, you're not out of luck. So. It's interesting to consider PowerShell to be experimental. Ex yeah. So, I mean, what what's going on is there's a uh, an IIS instance in the background, and you're essentially creating a, a web page that's running your code. And so if you think about it, running PowerShell in a web page is not mainstream like, you know, JavaScript or TypeScript or C Sharp is or something. So the other way, and one that I own, oh, this is, uh, so I had a problem. I was, I was doing some stuff, and I was getting PowerShell to work, and I was figuring all the mechanics. I uh, import my first module and just everything explodes. <clears throat> so I spent like a day fighting that. And then I got uh, Julie uh, on, a, on a Teams call. I'm like, Let, you know, help me out with this. What am I doing wrong? And you have to have 64-bit support turned on for the PowerShell module that I had. And I think it's just for PowerShell in general. But the function by default is 32-bit. So all the, <laughs> all the, you know, write host and out file and all that basic stuff worked great bring the 64-bit module in and... I, I didn't even know 32-bit uh, was still a thing. I thought, like, you know, much like 16-bit's no longer a thing. I thought 32-bit wasn't a thing anymore. It uh, it was a thing that tripped me up for... So, I mean, it's all those steps. Like, the, you create this, and you know, change this to V1, and change this to 32-bit, and do this and this, and it's just all these, you know... Sounds like a stellar blog post. Yeah, it, it should be good. So I need to do that. Now, uh, you, know, you just reminded me, uh, in PowerShell, I noticed, so uh, when I was running it the other day, helping somebody, um, up at the top now, when you first open PowerShell, it says, try the new cross-platform PowerShell, and it's pointing you to PowerShell 6. Uh, have you yeah. thought on that? I, I mean, I have I've not touched 6 still, and I can't believe they're like shoving it down my throat now. Yeah, so there's uh, been a bit of a split in PowerShell, sort of. There's the, the PowerShell that you and I have been, loved and enjoyed for the last 10 years, has always been Windows PowerShell, yep. though we just, it's like, you know, share, we only use uh, only use one name. But then a couple of years ago, they split it off into PowerShell Core. So there's PowerShell Core and Windows PowerShell. So the thing that you're getting the ad about is PowerShell Core. The thing that I'm using is Windows PowerShell. I've used PowerShell Core a little bit. The advantage that, that PowerShell Core has is this cross-platform. So it runs on Macs and whatever. I've actually installed it on a couple of Raspberry Pis just to play with it because that's what I'm comfortable with. But I've not played with PowerShell Core a bunch. Uh, Jeff Hicks always gives me hell about not doing things in Core, but I'm like, ah, I'm comfortable with the Windows PowerShell bit. Everything works. And I think, so then your modules have to support it and all that, so I just haven't, haven't fought with it much. It's, um, yeah, I mean, I remember when it came out and I just, yeah, I, I wrote it off. And I mean, at this point, I barely do PowerShell. Like, I got in there the other day and I forget, I was trying to do something. Oh, I was trying to concatenate strings. <laughs> and I'm like, I immediately wrote the Power App syntax. I'm like, well, that ain't it. I didn't do it, yep. Right, and then I was like, oh, you just shove them together. You don't actually concatenate them. You just pile the two string things up and it just happens. And I'm like... Yeah, but but it was very sad to see that my uh, PowerShell ninja-like skills are uh... have atrophied so much. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's uh, I've not played with Core much. It's uh, I should maybe do that. Yeah. Well, then so in there, you know, the whole reason I was in there um, mm -hmm. was we were fighting with SharePoint Online large list. Um, oh, I thought that problem was solved. Oh my God. So one of my customers is currently rocking uh, a document library with 440,000 documents. Um, Please tell me there's lots of nested folders in there too. Thousands? Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. And, um, what, you know, and from the business's point of view, it does exactly what they want, right? There's their folders, they find what they want, they add files, they edit files, they're great. But what happens, in these scenarios, right? Is they're like, oh, it works. And Microsoft says you can have three trillion items now. Unlimited, yeah. No, no reason to read the fine print, people. Just you no. saw three trillion was a number, roll with yep. it. Um, 
But so they're like, hey, we want to do this automated thing. We want to uh, reset the permissions on all those files. Right? They've gotten out of whack because the business does what the business wants. So we yep. just want to run that little, or we want to, they want, want to go into the UI and press the button that just says, you know, reset the whole thing back to it. Well, you press that button and it says, ah, you got too many files. I can't help you. <laughs> So then they, wanted <laughs> That's do, awesome. they wanted to do it in PowerShell. And PowerShell said, eh, you got too many files. I can't help you. Um, so then it's like, well, what if we just do it like folder by folder to get the subset? I started explaining the, the throttling problems to it. It's like, well, what if we just do it? I'm like, well, the problem is, is to get all the items in a specific folder requires an OData query. And the OData query says, not going to help you. Not anymore. We'll come back to this. I can't wait to hear this. Yeah. Um, so what I finally wrote for these guys, it is terrible and awful, but I figured it out in five minutes, so it works. It's basically we just are doing, you know, four one to five hundred thousand. Get item one, set the reset the permission. Get item two, reset, and we're just doing that four hundred forty thousand times to uh, reset all the file permissions, because right, getting an individual file is not a query, so it does not get the circuit breaker. So. Let's hear your solution, then we'll talk a little bit more about the circuit breakers. I have a, a similar customer situation. Okay. This is a customer that is using SharePoint on-prem, but all the mechanics are the same. Uh, and they have, man, I don't remember, half a terabyte of content in this. And it is a single document library, much like your story. 700,000 files, I forget how many folders, but I mean, they're, they're using it as a file system. So they installed SharePoint immediately, you know, map network drive and to the end users, it's just the file share. So they do file share things. Yep. Um, so we've talked to them, we need to break this out. Obviously we're not gonna keep it all in the one shared document library. So we've got sites and, you know, site collections and all this stuff mapped out for them. Now we need to get all that data out. And so it's data, you know, folder lengths, you know, five and six, probably 10 folders deep. And what I discovered was three or four months ago, maybe more, I don't remember, the PNP get PNP folder commandlet. So I guess back up. So in SharePoint online and on-prem, the folders in document libraries are not actual folders like they're in the file system. It's just a, a phony string of text that SharePoint shows you but it doesn't it's not an object it doesn't exist right. so that makes traversing them like Shane was trying to do very difficult because there's not actually a thing there uh so the pnp folks uh, a few months ago to pnp folder added two properties to the you can do get pnp folder and there are two properties there folders and files so you can find a folder with pnp get the folder objects or files inside of that folder. And it does give you all that. It doesn't make you do all the string manipulation, counting the backslashes and all that. So you could have done a recursion thing where you said at the root, get folders for each folder, get folders and strip through. And then for each file in here, reset the permissions and then zip back up. Your thing works as well, but you don't have to do all the OData stuff and the string manipulation and all that you can. Well, so my... So, so that's interesting. I didn't know about the get PMP folder. I'm not discounting it. But, but at the end of the day, it's still basically going and touching. It's running 500 or 700,000 commands, right? Because you're... Yeah, it might not be faster than your thing, you know, in execution. Right. Well, and so in mine was not... I didn't do any of the complexities you thought because or that you're thinking I did well you because you're doing it on 100 percent of the files whereas yes. i have to pull chunks i have to yeah. pull this folder and all of itself folder. yeah hmm. interesting well in in the and what's tough um man we're gonna spend the rest of the show on this whole topic i can already tell but so what's tough with these guys um is where i first encountered this document library was a, we were having a flow problem where he wanted to do he wanted to query folders and so that was an no data query where back to your idea of the strings yep it's pretty um, ugly and so that one just, it just told me no, right? And, and I'm guessing that there's not, whatever the PMP folks have done, it is not overcoming the OData problem. They just found some trickier code uh, to do. Yeah, so I mean, it's all open source. Right. Uh, so you can check, which is weird because I've actually done that for something else. I've actually looked at it. There was a command that was working all squirrely, not the way I expected. So I actually just went into the code looked at it and like, oh, yeah, that's I don't agree with that. But that explains the behavior. Um, 
but what I'm guessing is they are building that string internally somewhere. And, you know, and, and so if anybody's listening and they're doing this, when you do the get PNP folder, the folders property and the files property are two of the properties that are not hydrated by default. So you have to do the get PNP folder and then get PNP property to get the folders and files property of that folder. And then you can traverse it. It's a little clumsy. Yeah, that would be another great blog post probably. No, it sounds like a stellar one. These are the type of problems that you know we're starting to see a lot of is this yeah. scale ones. And, um, and just to kind of, for those of you that might not, you're like, well, what do you mean this whole file limit problem? Right? Let's just talk about this for a second. Yeah. You know, and I'll probably get it wrong, so then Todd will correct me, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll I live for that. I live for that. Part. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically the way that I understand it, um, you know, so SharePoint, if you have a list with less than 5,000 items, then you never have what we hit called a list view threshold limit. Mm -hmm. So you can do things like OData query. You can run programmatic calls that grab those 5,000 items back and then filter, sort, do that type of thing. Because basically those queries can only get up to 5,000 items before all of a sudden SharePoint Online says, hey, you're making me work too hard. I'm not going to do this thing. So that's where this idea of this 5,000 item limit comes from. It's been around since SharePoint 2010, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, it used to be 2,000 right before that. Yeah. yeah. So we were excited when we got to 5,000. Um, but so then if you're fancy and you know that really what you want to do is you want to query on a specific column, if you have less than 25,000 items, then you can set that, con that column to be an index column. And so then now you can do OData queries against that column up to 25,000 items. So once again, you've taken 5,000, you've gotten to 25,000, you've really extended your runway to do it. But basically when you get to 25,001 items in that list, there's, as far as I can tell, there's no programmatic way to like do OData queries or you know get, get filtered data back from SharePoint in these scenarios. So. I have not done as much of it in the way that you have, but from what I understand, the, res the, the problem does not come from the size of the list. The problem comes from the size of the result set for whatever you're doing. So the problem first showed up in SharePoint on-prem. If you had a document library and your view showed every item in the document library and there was over 2,000 views, 2,000 items in that view, then it would throttle you. But if there's some kind of query that SharePoint could do on the back end to, to reduce that number of items, then you wouldn't get throttled. So it was a result issue, not a list issue. That has not been my experience. So, and 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 for the on-prem thing, what this bore out of was a SQL problem. SQL would lock. So every site collection in a content database, all of the files and folders were in a single table. And what we experienced ten years ago with SharePoint was getting so large that when people would go to a document library and SharePoint would say, "Hey, SQL, send me all the names for the documents in this you know li list or library," SQL would lock that table or lock that content database, and nobody else could use it. So these were this problem got big. Um, but so I thought it was an, an issue of that. Now, depending on where your query is executed and where that 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 bottleneck is, we should talk to Mark because he's done a bunch with this and he might be able to get you some ways around that. Uh, but I thought it was if you could if you could send a query in such a way that the query happened far enough on the back end that the result set was small enough, then you would not have a problem. So... Well, and, and to be completely transparent, I've been doing, like when I was fighting with this, I was mostly doing it through an OData query via Flow. So maybe it's Flow's fault. Maybe Flow wasn't smart enough to do it. I, I didn't yeah. try, because, right? Because the problem set I was trying to solve was 100% in Flow, so I didn't care if PowerShell yeah, yeah. could do it. Yep. But my, but I'm almost positive in Flow, like I literally tried on that, 400,000 item list to say, um, you know, get where ID equals 12, right? Right. Yeah. Just one result. Exactly one result. Yeah. Yeah. And it just said, go away. No one likes yeah. you. But, so uh, I've not done it in flow, but I know. So and when Shane talks about the OData searching, I don't know enough about all that, but I know that in PowerShell, there's kind of two ways you can filter things. So if I do like get AD user, uh, and you know, set all the true and my, my one customer has 14,000 users. I'm going to get 14,000 users back, but then I can pipe that through where, or I can use the where property or whatever. And I can shrink that down to get the users that I want, you know, where users equal Todd, you know, whatever that filter is happening on the front end that's happening on my machine 
that commandlet that I'm running is pulling 14,000 things in, and then it's sending it through the pipeline to the where commandlet that's running on my machine, filtering it out that way. Yep. Get Azure AD user and a ton of other PowerShell commandlets have the option. They have a filter parameter, and that's the OData filters that Shane's talking about. And the back end of that works in such a way that if I do an OData filter with get Azure AD user, I can send the filter that happens on the back end. And Azure AD, instead of saying, get me all the users and I'll sort them, says, hey, Azure AD, get me all the users that match this. And then, I mean, you can just look at the network traffic. It's just a smaller amount of things coming through. So that's kind of what we're talking about with the OData thing that, that happens farther back in the stack. So it hopefully fixes some of these problems, but I don't know how Flow implements that. Yeah, it's only something we should go and play. We, right, why is it when you and I are both on customer calls all day long, we should we should hop on a session and just uh, play with it. Yeah, this. when I'm just sitting around looking for stuff to do, you know. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> 2020, 2020? May Is that the next year? Because I, uh, I don't know, yeah. It's real tough. We both actually have like jobs that have to work. It's, it's very sad. Oh goodness, it's been uh, been very a very busy summer. I mean, fun, great projects, but man, I just have not uh, not had a moment's rest. Um, so we probably have time for one more small topic. I'll save C for later. Of the other ones, is there anything cool you want to talk about? Um, we can save F because we don't have that yet anyway. Um, yep. I mean, I guess we either E or G. E All right, I'll really do small. I'll do G. Uh, G falls under the category of probably a paid advertisement, uh, oh. so I want to be upfront about that. As an MVP, we get a bunch of companies that give us free things, yep. and it has been great, and I love them all tremendously. One of those companies is Digicert. So Digicert is a company that uh, does digital certificates. I know that was tough to suss out from the name, uh, but it can be, I, I've used them for websites. Shane uses them for code signing. They are, they're just one of the big leaders in digital certificates. So all of the things that I'm going to talk about from here on out, they gave me for free because I'm an MVP. Hopefully that doesn't tint my view of them too much. Uh, for those of you that were going to my website a couple of weeks ago, my uh, certificate expired. So these days, you just can't have a website without an SSL, TSL cert. I mean, browsers legitimately block them now. That infuriates me because there is nothing on my blog that matters. It doesn't matter if the traffic is sniffed along the way while somebody's reading one of my blog posts. There's, just, there's no credentials going through there. It doesn't matter, but I have to have it because Google does it for search ranking and your browsers complain to you. So when I rebuilt my server here a couple of years ago, I put an SSL cert on it and talked to the folks at DigiCert. Now, Putting a certificate in IIS, because I run my blog on SharePoint 2010, Windows Server, you know, 2008 R2 or whatever, I forget what it is, but really the peak prime years, the glory days of Windows and SharePoint. Um, putting a certificate on IIS is not particularly friendly, but not horribly complicated, but it's one of those things that you do once a year. And then you forget about it, and it's like seven or eight steps, and then a year later, and it's always on the eve of your certificate expiring, or after your certificate is expired, so you're all nervous, and then you got to remember these seven or eight steps again. Um, and the other thing about certificates is they encrypt your data going across so that bad people can't sniff it, but they also verify who you are so that somebody doesn't pretend to be a website that they're not. And because of that, identity is really important. So every time I renew my certificate with DigiCert, there's some new level of security that has to happen. I've had to, you know, send them a copy of my, my driver's license, talk to them on the phone, blood samples, all these, uh, these things like that. And my certificate expired. I was in the panic mode. There was all this new stuff. And DigiCert did a great job of getting me up and going right away. Super helpful. Had exactly all the answers to all the questions that I had. I had to talk to somebody on the phone because they needed to verify. It was all super easy. They've got a tool that does all the certificate bits. Um, so I wanted to give them a shout out for that. If you're looking for certificates, there's a bunch of different companies that do it. But give DigiCert a look. I, it makes it very easy. Low stress. Nope. I I echo all the things you say, and it, and it is it is funny, right? I remember that first one, like, we have to call and talk to you. I'm like, who talks to humans now? Um, I can use the computer in my pocket to talk to humans? What? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It, see, and, so speaking, I, I mean, I know we were going to skip uh, the Tesla stuff. But I will we'll do a different Tesla story real quick. All right. So I got, uh, or Nicole, I got a flat tire in the Tesla on uh, oh, Saturday. I, I, I remember that you, you texted me. <laughs> yep, yep. And um, so, you know, the Teslas don't have spares, um, mm -hmm. right? And A, it's a weight savings. B, the other problem is the car weighs like 6,000, 5,000 something pounds. 
and basically, you know, you'd have to have a full size spare. You couldn't have that little rinky dinky thing. It would just bend in half. Yep. And so either Tesla can, uh, if they have a loaner tire, they'll come out or a loaner wheel, they'll come out, put it on, let you go. Or if not, then they tow you back to their service center for free and, you know, take care of it there. They, they understand this is the shortcoming of the car. So they, they, they cover it yeah. well. Anyway, when I was in there, the guy's like, hey, you need tires. I'm like, you're correct. I knew I needed tires. I didn't want to buy tires. And so anyway, the entire transaction of sorting out my, my tire uh, issue, buying tires, everything about it was done via text. And I was like. That's insane. I love you, right? I mean, the idea that this guy literally just texted me, hey, Shane, I'm looking at your car. You know, you, you probably should put you know, a new tire. I mean, like literally the whole thing. I was like, this this is what I want. I don't want this guy to call and bother me. He texted me, I responded, you know. So anyway, shout out to them. I think that that's engaging your customers where they want to be engaged. And I just thought that was a super, right? You know, a lot of times we're like, yo, you could never do that. Why not, right? No one told them they couldn't, so they just did it. Yeah. I, I, I like to explain to folks that Elon is not uh, in any way restricted by reality. Like it's just not a concern of his at all. Uh, so I had a similar thing. Somebody stole the lug nut covers off of one of my wheels. And I, and I didn't notice it when it happened. So I have this weird tradition every time I use a supercharger, since I supercharge for free, I feel like I'm getting away with something. And uh, so I take a picture of it. So I've got a picture of every time I supercharged for the last you know year. Uh, and I went back and in December, I had uh, all of my lug nut covers. And in January, on the front passenger side wheel, they were gone. I don't know why that, so uh, you know, did Tesla's got the app with the service thing. One thing that stinks is I knew I didn't have to take it to a service center for this. This is, you know, ridiculous, but you have to pick a service center. And then I'm like, Hey, I need uh, lug nut covers. And then yeah, the Tesla Ranger texts me and he's like, Hey, this is James. I'm on my way. And oh, I guess James is the old guy. Uh, and he had showed up in my house, had the lug nut covers. We popped them on and it was all text until he got there. It was all, it was perfect. Loved it. So just, right, as you guys thinking about solving problems like our PowerShell problem from a different angle, yeah. you know, I, you can solve things like this. You can, you can run a whole business by texting people and yeah, you know, yeah. So anyway, all right, let's shut this thing down. All right, everybody. So uh, thanks for sticking around. I think, you know, unless something crazy happens, we're going to do this two weeks in a row, two weeks. Should we go beating our previous record of, you know, zero or whatever? Oh, uh, I mean, let me just look at my calendar real quick and just see if it's just not a, a flat no already. Yeah. Let me look. I'm bringing mine up. I, I got nothing. I don't, uh, yeah. There's not... a hold for a one day training class on mine. Block it out. No, I mean, I don't know if, it, I think it's saying that the customer has the date. So the customer has the option of taking it. So oh, but you should commit to doing the podcast next week, whether or not I make it. Can you do that for the people? How many podcasts did you do while I was on vacation? A thousand. Zero. Okay. Fair enough. So, <laughs> Some yeah. number. I forget. It's either the, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, are. call that customer and tell them that you're sick. Call them right now. Tell them you're sick. <laughs> but you'll be better on Thursday. Oh, or Tuesday. All right. All right. Uh, but yeah, no, everybody, thank you for putting up with us. We know the summer holiday is tough, but it's yep. life is uh, life. Yeah. And I promise to start producing some podcasts here. Damn. <laughs> see you guys next week. Toodles.